Hey guys, Tyler here. The Intrepid class is a starship design of the United Federation of Planets that entered service in the late 24th century. Designed primarily for long-term exploration missions, the Intrepid is half the length of a Galaxy-class starship like the USS Enterprise D. The Intrepid is considered quick and smart and possesses a number of new, innovative technologies that set it apart from other starship classes. The most well-known member of the Intrepid class is the USS Voyager, which was stranded for seven years in the Milky Way's Delta Quadrant, as seen in Star Trek Voyager. In this video, I'd like to examine a few key aspects of the Intrepid class comparing its tech and design language to our expectations about real interstellar spacecraft. Let's get started. Before we go any further, a word from today's sponsor, Galaxy's Edge Fan Expo. Have you ever wanted to meet the authors behind some of your favorite military sci-fi novels? Well, the chance approaches. Galaxy's Edge Fan Expo is an annual sci-fi convention in Oak Harbor, Washington. This year's special guests include Jason Onspock, John Spears, Joshua Gayu, Peter Nealon, and more to be announced as the convention approaches. Activities include author and fan meetups, airsoft, wilderness skills classes, two catered breakfasts, two all-you-can-eat barbecue dinners, and tabletop gaming. And just like last year's expo, Galaxy's Edge 2023 will include a charity auction to raise funds for Mission 22, helping provide assistance to military veterans in need. Galaxy's Edge Fan Expo, coming July 21st through 23rd, 2023. Click either of the links at the top of my description box or in the pinned comment or scan the QR code to buy your tickets today. And big thanks to Galaxy's Edge for sponsoring today's video. Now, back to the Intrepid class. Intrepid class vessels are typically 344 meters, or 1,128 feet, in length, 116 meters, or 380 feet, in width, and weigh 700,000 metric tons. They have 15 decks that house a crew complement of approximately 150. Their top speed, or more accurately, their maximum sustainable cruise velocity, is warp 9.975, over 5,000 times the speed of light. Hmm, maybe I should do a video on the warp scale. The Intrepid class's standard armament includes phaser arrays, spatial charges, and torpedo tubes that are compatible with photon torpedoes, quantum torpedoes, and tricobalt devices. And their primary defenses are deflector shields which I do have a whole video about, link in the description. When the Intrepid class was first commissioned, it featured several innovations that were just then becoming technically feasible. Among these were the tricyclic input manifold, variable geometry pylons, bioneural gel packs, and the Mark I Emergency Medical Hologram, or EMH. Okay, I just listed a bunch of technobabble words there. The tricyclic input manifold has to do with the way electroplasma delivers energy from the warp core to the nacelles, a process I go into in my warp drives video. The Emergency Medical Hologram honestly deserves a video of its own. What I want to primarily focus on in this video is the bioneural gel packs and variable geometry pylons. Why did I pick these two in particular? Well, you'll see. Bioneural gel packs are a form of computer technology first developed for use by Starfleet in the early 2370s. The gel packs are a major component of bioneural circuitry, which is a hybrid organic electronic computer system. The packs contain neural fibers surrounded by a blue gel with metallic interfaces on the top and bottom. They help store more information and operate at faster speeds than isolinear circuitry, which was the computer technology dominant throughout Starfleet earlier in the 24th century. The fibers of bioneural gel packs are capable of making billions of connections, generating an incredibly sophisticated and super responsive computing architecture. This kind of organic circuitry allows computers to think in ways similar to living organisms. That is, they operate by using a sort of fuzzy logic to arrive at best guesses to solve complex problems, rather than working through all possible calculations. This is due in part to the inherent ability of organic neural systems to correlate chaotic patterns that elude the capacities 
of conventional hardware. Notably, bioneural gel packs cannot be replicated. Like other biological forms, they are susceptible to bacteria and viruses that can be removed by inducing a sort of fever into the systems. This synthesis of organic and artificial neurochemistry is kind of unique in Star Trek. Though even as far back as season one of The Next Generation, we see that there are some races in the galaxy besides the Borg who have embraced cybernetics and transhumanism. But this is a much simpler, arguably more brilliant application of the concept. The neural tissues in bioneural circuitry are not themselves sentient, but rather they help simulate the electrical processes that occur within animal brains. This is a pretty big deal since in real life one of the biggest hindrances to developing true artificial intelligence is that well, we still don't really understand a lot of things about the human brain. We often fall into the trap of thinking that artificial intelligence has everything to do with data storage and processing power. But the truth is, this is only a small part of the issue. The human brain is estimated to have a storage capacity of 2.5 petabytes, equivalent to 2,500 terabytes, over 300 times the amount of storage space that I have on my admittedly high-end desktop computer. But it becomes even more complicated when you realize that it's perhaps more accurate to think of that number as the brain's memory capacity. And my computer has only 32 gigabytes of RAM. Estimates for the raw processing power of the human brain also vary wildly, but a common figure is one exaflop, or a billion billion calculations per second. The fastest supercomputer on Earth as of 2023 is Hewlett Packard's Enterprise Frontier in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. Huh. Enterprise Frontier in my home state. You can't make this stuff up, folks. And its speed comes in at, wait for it, over 1,000 petaflops or one exaflop. But we'd hardly call this thing sentient. It's used to perform calculations for scientific research, not comment on the artistic value of a Van Gogh painting. Oh my God. And it still requires far more processing power than the human brain. 21 megawatts versus roughly 10 to 15 watts. For comparison, a modern gaming PC uses less than one kilowatt. And perhaps most importantly, Frontier fills a space that is 680 square meters or 7,300 square feet in size or the floor area of three typical one-story houses combined. But even if you miniaturize all that into the size of a human cranium, like with data, it still ends up being more of a software problem than a hardware problem. We still don't exactly know where consciousness comes from, and it's possible that human emotions, which Data's older brother Lore has a better grasp on than Data himself, may be essential for simulating consciousness to the level required for a true AI. This is why, in my 2021 video about AI in Star Trek, I concluded that it is more realistic that humans would take centuries, not decades, to truly crack artificial general intelligence. For bioneural gel packs, it's this 24th century software revolution that, in my view, would be primarily responsible for helping produce computers capable of the fuzzy logic we often take for granted. Once again, thinking more abstractly than exhausting all possible solutions. It's also said in the non-canon USS Voyager Illustrated Handbook that the doctor's evolution into a fully sentient being is partly due to the bioneural circuitry's capabilities. The handbook notes that holograms created by isolinear systems had rarely been able to achieve anything approaching sentience. Some exceptions, of course, including Moriarty, Regina Bartholomew, and Minuet. Bioneural circuitry may be an early stage of what forms the basis of standard issue computer systems in the far future. These include the 31st century time ship encountered by the NX-01 Enterprise in Future Tense, and may include the 29th century mobile holographic emitter.
Shifting gears, the variable geometry pylons are another key feature of the Intrepid class's design that, at first, I didn't give much thought to. But after making my warp drive video, I realized this feature is a much bigger deal than you might initially suspect. The gist of the variable geometry pylon is that, on starships where it's installed, the warp nacelles can be raised into position for warp speed, then lowered for slower than light speeds. The pylons are raised any time the ship's warp field is at power levels above idle, even if it's not being used for the propulsive effect. This mechanic may make some level of intuitive sense in our minds, but the reality of the situation would be much more complex. The thing is, in space, it doesn't matter what's the shape of your starship. Acceleration through a vacuum is not like acceleration through air or water. The fluid dynamics of Earth's oceans and atmosphere make it so you'll always face some form of resistance. Naturally, in the case of air, air resistance. You may remember from science class in school that a lot of physics problems say to ignore air resistance. Now, this isn't really applicable in most real-world physics problems, but in space, it's kind of true. Even though there's stray hydrogen atoms in virtually every cubic meter of space, even in the intergalactic medium, those don't provide anywhere near the level of resistance that an actual fluid does so it really is negligible. Of course, the Boussard collectors in the warp nacelles of many starships collect stray hydrogen and other particles to replenish fuel. But there isn't really such a thing as being aerodynamic in space as long as your thrusters are pointed in the right direction. This is why the shape of Starfleet warp vessels is rather arbitrary, if we're only talking about sublight travel. But we're not. The thing that honestly fascinates me about variable geometry pylons is that they actually could matter if certain real-world theories about faster-than-light travel hold true. I referenced this as well in my warp drives video when talking about reducing the energy requirements for a faster-than-light ship. In 2012, physicist Harold White and collaborators published research demonstrating how modifying the geometry of exotic matter could significantly lower the mass energy requirements for a macroscopic FTL ship. Previously, it was estimated that a mass equivalent to the planet Jupiter was required to power such a vessel, but White's team reduced this mass to the equivalent of the Voyager 1 spacecraft, which weighs 700 kilograms. Their proposal involves thickening the wall of a warp bubble so the energy can be focused in a larger volume. In a 2D representation, this ring of positive and negative energy becomes a large fuzzy torus, or donut shape. However, this leaves less flat space to house a spacecraft and the spacecraft thus has to be smaller. I've previously described how this could have been a limiting factor in the size of early Earth warp ships like the Phoenix, but as warp technology improved over the decades, starships could gradually become larger and larger effectively a reverse of the process of miniaturization. All of this is to say that there's potentially a real-world theoretical physics basis for a starship's shape being streamlined and warp geometry actually mattering. Of course, Miguel Acubiera, who arguably pioneered modern warp research with his 1994 drive concept, has expressed skepticism about White's model. He said such manipulation of warp geometry may not be possible for centuries, if at all. But it also should be noted that White's model is not the only one that reduces the positive energy requirements for a faster-than-light spacecraft. One more interesting tidbit is that when Gene Roddenberry and Matt Jeffries were experimenting with Starship designs for the original series, they laid down two major ground rules. The first rule was that, when looking at the ship from its side, the nacelles should have clear space between them, unobstructed by any other elements. The in-universe explanation is that the warp field is strongest in between the nacelles, and it would be hazardous for anything to be in between them. When filming Star Trek The Motion Picture, they even played with the idea of having some kind of visible effect between the nacelles when the ship is at warp 
as illustrated by this concept art. The second rule was that, when looking at it from the front, the nacelles should also be in clear view and, again, not obstructed by any other ship elements. The in-universe explanation is that the front of the nacelles hold the Bussard scoops. When Voyager was being designed, the show's art department opted for a sleek, flattened design, which made it impossible to stick to both of these rules simultaneously. Essentially, when Voyager is not at warp, the nacelles are lowered to have a clear view from the front and allow the Bassard collectors to work, and when it goes to warp, it lifts the nacelles so they rise above the engineering hull and have clear space between them. I obviously have only scratched the surface of the Intrepid class in this video. I didn't go into as much detail about its weapon systems, its state-of-the-art medical facilities, or its interior layout, for example. But as you can probably tell, I wanted to focus on a few standout aspects of this state-of-the-art ship class. Hopefully this video was still entertaining and informative. I honestly learned a lot doing the research for the script. In any event, thank you all so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to leave a thumbs up down below and don't forget to share it. That stuff really helps me out. If you haven't subscribed yet, be sure to do that as well so you won't miss future uploads and click the bell icon to receive all notifications. If you want to support my work even further, becoming a patron or a member is a great way to do so. Links to those, as well as my social media and merch store, are in the description. That's all I have for this week. Live long and prosper. Thank you.